Hello, I'm Matthew Kingpin. You know, time is a funny thing, because it has a way of oftentimes single-handedly making individuals grow to dislike things they once used to enjoy, and vice versa as people inevitably grow and change over time. Well, at least as some people do. However, one game that has managed to elude any cessation of enjoyment that I derive from it is the semi-popular open-world zombie parkour game Dying Light, released around a decade ago now as of May 2024. I've got many different cherished games in the expansive zeitgeist that is my list of personal favorites, but why does Dying Light tend to populate towards the top of that list so frequently, and why do I find myself constantly desiring to run through its entire loop of progression for another new playthrough with every unique, even semi-decent friend I happen to come across? I believe the answer lies in how expertly crafted the overarching systems of engagement the world of Haran, the game's setting, offers are, how these systems intertwine with one another to stave off any potential loss of enjoyment, and how the core design features of the game happen to almost perfectly, either intentionally by design or otherwise, align with certain behavioral oddities that arise from my particular autistic and ADHD-addled brand of existence. When it comes to Dying Light, much in the same vein of how the city of Haran itself appears at first glance to be wholly too expansive to fully comprehend, the actual nitty gritty of how the moment to moment gameplay loop tends to play out is much easier to grapple than one might ascertain by just taking a haphazard glance in its general direction. Almost every part of that aforementioned gameplay loop is entertaining, engaging, and generously rewarding in micro bursts of sweet, sweet dopamine pumped directly into the player's jungle gym climbing monkey brain. However, good baseline gameplay systems and an addicting loop of play are staples of many video games these days. They're so ubiquitous that they can even be found attached to a game that's, well, complete crap. What makes Dying Light so special, and why do I believe that it is so super effective, especially on the interesting and beautiful messes of heads of the neurodivergent identifying? It boils down to outstanding presentation and the ease of access of being able to switch up which gameplay system of Dying Light you are mechanically engaging with at any given time. So let's first talk presentation. Man, does this game absolutely love to just gorily glorify every grotesque and gratuitous instance of violence that your character can engage in. The wet crack of a zombie's waning skull cavity as a baseball bat relieves it of its contents. The supremely satisfying sizzle of an undead seared soma as it becomes engulfed in flames from a well-placed slash from an incendiary sickle. The absolutely astonishing auditory symphony of agony as a viral cries out its final audacious scream as a brutally delivered shotgun blast atomizes its decrepit reanimated cadaver back into the hell from which it spawned. My god does this game sound like heaven. A heaven for those who enjoy the indiscriminate extermination of the blissfully unaware wandering formerly existent. But the righteous decimation of the Horde isn't the only duty one finds themselves obligated to engage in within the walls of the quarantined district. There's also the graceful art of blazing through the many rooftop routes and opportunities to precisely maneuver in, around, above, through, and aside the seemingly endless hordes of zombies just as often as one might take the time to send them all six feet under for the last time. The parkour in Dying Light inspires a unique feeling of genuine badassery and mastery of motion that seldom few games in general manage to pull off, let alone without having the added hurdle of doing so from a first-person perspective, a point of view that famously causes issues with negatively impacting the feel of platforming in irreconcilable ways. Movement in Dying Light is refined to a point where even when Kyle Crane is just unceremoniously climbing a cracked and decrepit construction for the 10,000th time it still retains its initial deeply satisfactory charm. But these gameplay mechanics too have been done in other games as well, the original Dead Island for example in terms of the game's combat, or titles like Mirror's Edge for a similar comparison to the game's free-running system. What makes Dying Light win over both of these titles and then some in my eyes? It's about the pristine and gorgeous harmony these two systems of play manage to create by their seamless juxtaposition to one another.
Have you ever found yourself discovering a new piece of music that gels with you in a prolifically intense manner, quickly populating the top of your most played and earning your seemingly endless admiration, only for this almost obsessive love to backfire and cause eventual burnout of the media, leading to it being hastily discarded and stored away within the realms of the unconscious memory, seldom revisited or listened to again? This is a phenomenon common to many different pieces of art, not least of which including video games. Sometimes, even despite an addicting and immensely satisfying mechanical structure, a game that was once immeasurably enjoyable can become stale and no longer provide the same spark of whimsy and fun that it once offered. This is a problem that Dying Light gloriously transcends with its almost perfect amount of variety on offer. Let me explain. Something that a lot of game developers, and indeed artists in general, do not understand is that sometimes having too many characters, choices, mechanics, etc. is actually quite harmful for the engagement of the player, just in the same vein as how having too few choices can cause stagnation and eventual disengagement with the material. Analysis paralysis is the operative term for this situation, and it's where a player has so many unique options to pick from that they find themselves unable to choose between any of them. Even in the case where they do choose a specific approach, they might feel as if they wish they chose something else, regretting their decision and feeling like they might have overlooked something. Buyer's remorse, to use another relevant term. Dying Light, in a very Goldilocksian manner, has an amount of gameplay variety that is just right to not cause the player to feel like they are missing anything, but also giving them just enough variety to where there's never too much exposure of one system at any one given time. By the time the player is even getting an inkling of an iota of an idea of getting exhausted by a game system, they've already seamlessly and subconsciously switched to another. And because each game system is so well crafted and engaging, there's no feeling of mechanical dread from going from one mechanic to another. Fighting is just as fun as fleeing. Slashing is just as fun as sliding. Grappling is just as fun as, well, crappling. To top all of this off, the game world itself offers plentiful opportunities to engage with and switch between these systems of play all throughout the game's runtime. These take the form of constant flashing compass offers to check out a new and exciting distraction on the horizon, each offering a tangible and satisfactory reward such as extra loot, XP, or bits of fun character interaction that come with doing the game's many offered side objectives, most of which are wacky, funny, and at times seriously heartfelt in a way that even the main story can't compete with. Everything feeds into itself in a sort of zombified Ouroboros of extreme entertainment, where the mantra of just five more minutes really does tend to quickly become just five more hours, as one can easily lose themselves in chasing fun diversion upon fun diversion. All of these points, however, much as they've been unapologetic glowing praise over the game's design, haven't specifically divulged into the stated thesis for this video, both in the opening paragraph and indeed in the video's title. So, how does this all relate to the complex and esoteric brain chemistry that is attributed to myself and many of my friends' neurodivergent selves? In case you're unaware as a viewer, uh, not sure how, considering how weird I am, yes, I'm both autistic and ADHD adult, which, for the sake of brevity of explanation, basically just means that my brain has some odd settings. There are certain things that interest me that would come across as quite obtuse to the average neurotypical, which is a term for someone with normal brain chemistry, and certain behaviors I engage in that would, as the youth would say, scare the hose away. One of these interests slash behaviors that many neurodivergent folks, such as myself, find enjoyable is the act of stimming, engaging in a repetitive task that deliberately placates one of your senses with stimulation, in lieu of the term. How this translates and relates to Dying Light is, because the game world is always trying to distract you with new opportunities to go off the beaten path and receive extra goodies for doing so, and because its sound design, world design, combat design, and parkour design are so immaculately crafted, the game essentially turns into, as this video's title suggests, a playground for people with my particular type of brain chemistry. As macabre as it might sound out of context, it really is a satisfying stim to detach a dead man's digits with an electrically amplified machete as you simultaneously disarm them and watch them zap fry like a microwave-bound, human-shaped frankfurter. 
It's also a satisfying stim to jump across rooftops and hear the rhythmic running of boots upon their tin-covered constructions as Kyle Crane zooms around obstacles with ever-increasing gracefulness and agility, both because your in-game experience bar has filled up and because your real-life experience with pressing the required buttons to navigate the world has increased in tandem. The game's co-op mode is handled really spectacularly as well in regards to how myself and my neurodivergent friends commonly tend to interact with games. The cooperative experience of Dying Light is extremely laissez-faire in what it expects out of the party for things like quest progression or world progression to occur. How it accomplishes this is by allowing things like easily shared inventory items even with huge level disparities between players, meaning if my friend doesn't want to engage with a certain aspect of the open world, such as grinding car parts in the following DLC for example, I can just drop them level 5 parts in all categories, even at the start of the game, only requiring one player to grab key items, only requiring one player to travel to certain locations, and only requiring one player to have to talk to certain NPCs to advance and receive quests. Those of you who have played the game's co-op before might be raising an eyebrow at those last few statements, however, as all partners are technically required to be next to an NPC before they will talk with the player. But a nice quality of life feature that co-op includes is the ability to instantly teleport to your co-op partner's location at the press of a button to further quest goals, which effectively translates to only one person has to actually focus on the quests, while everyone else can have fun and get lost in the endless opportunities to stim offered up by the city of Haran and its never-ending blue quest markers, if they so desire. Getting an ADHD-addled individual or a TISM baby to focus on an objective can oftentimes be an exceptionally difficult task, take it from someone who is both of these things, so the game offering a lot of leniency in that regard makes playing with those who are easily distracted a lot more enjoyable. After all, the game is built on distractions. Distractions that are oftentimes just as rewarding or even more so than the actual quests. Overall, every part of the game's design is more than happy to accommodate and even outright celebrate the many oddities that arise from my, well, oddities from me just being me. It feels very inclusive out of a game, and I don't really get that feeling very often, out of any piece of media really. So Dying Light is quite special to me in that regard. It means a lot. That's about all I have to say for this production. It's a bit of a niche topic, I am aware, and it's definitely not even peripherally Counter-Strike related, but neurodivergent related things have always been particularly intriguing to me, uh, partially because, you know, I am one. And especially when it comes to Dying Light, the most enjoyment with the game other people have had with it across the large variety of different folks I've climbed the towers of progression inside the game with came from those who were also off the beaten path of mental normalcy, much as myself. And I made this video just because I wanted to talk about one of my favorite games. Dying Light is a very close game to my heart. Anyways, the next video will be about something. I'm not sure what yet. I wanted to make a Helldivers 2 video, but the whole Sony account fiasco blasted away a lot of my desire to talk about the game. Corrupt corporations tend to be a bit of a conversational and motivational buzzkill. Regardless though, thank you all so much for choosing to tune in and watch my content. Watching me. It really does mean a lot. As always, please give me any and all feedback you have, it is all read and appreciated deeply. Burn your dread, go into the future, and I'll meet you there. Alright. Who's not? Zeus No, 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 no. I have a, a way funnier way to kill him. chicken for you. I do not think so, my friend. I don't know if you'll hear the defuse. Oh. <laughs> 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 you window frame. <laughs> you window. <laughs> that was funny as